Join us today as we share videos from the vault, special presentations, past interviews, and share with you the ARE through the ages. Whether you've been here physically or not before, um, so many people that come to this campus talk about it being a homecoming and how um, when they were here, they felt something um, that called them home. Um, so welcome, and I know that you're going to have a wonderful experience. And we are going to start off talking about reincarnation and the study group, the first study group, as well as the prayer group, um, and how that became a renewal of spirit um, in Edgar Cayce's lifetime in this lifetime. So when we think about reincarnation, being technically challenged. We often think that we might be, have in the past life been a rock star, <laughs> or perhaps some sort of royalty, or even the pharaoh. But in reality, most of us are just normal, average people living our lives. Um, thank you to my son, Sam, who will be turning eight soon as the model, who I believe has had many incarnations here at the ARE, he, or with the, the soul group at the ARE. He calls the ARE his happy place. Yes. <clears throat> so when uh, Edgar Casey gave over 2,500 life readings um, to individuals, and when the first group gathered together, the first study group, it was not a good time for Edgar Casey and his family or the organization that would later become the Association for Research and Enlightenment. He had uh, been told that he would have to leave his home. It w belonged to the Blumenthal's um, who had withdrawn their support um, from the organization and from Edgar Casey. And he was given less than a month to move all of his items out. The hospital closed. And his dream, his lifelong dream, what he thought was his lifelong dream and goal, basically disintegrated before his eyes. And he actually wrote a letter um, <clears throat> to a friend saying that he thought that maybe that he was finished in this lifetime, that maybe it was time for him to go. And so when this group of people gathered together, the study group, and um, <clears throat> after the hospital had closed, he had been given readings around town. He often went to downtown Norfolk and gave talks, um, as well as giving talks at the hospital here in Virginia Beach. And so um, several people asked if he would continue to give those talks. And a group of them gathered together, uh, one of them being Hewlin Casey, his eldest son. Um, and he said that most of them had gathered there hoping that they might get a final sort of personal something um, in the reading. Um, and they were surprised <laughs> um, and somewhat confused by the reading that was given. And even in this first reading, um, which is the 262 readings, which is call, also called the study group readings or search for God readings, uh, it was given on September 14th in 1931 at 8 p.m. And it's alluded to that these people have been together before. Uh, Gertrude Casey was the conductor, and she said, You will have before you the group gathered in this room who desire as a group to be guided through these forces as to how they may best be a channel in presenting to the world the truth and light needed. You will answer the questions which this group will ask. And the source responded, Yes, we have the group as a group as gathered here seeking to be a channel that they, as a group, as individuals, may be and give the light to the waiting world. So right there, that's sort of a challenge. <laughs> you all are supposed to bring light to the waiting world. But he goes a little bit further, and he alludes to the fact that they had been together before. As each have gathered here, as each gathered here has been associated in their various experiences in the earth, as each has prepared themselves for a channel through these experiences, so may they, as a group, combine their efforts in a cooperative manner 
to give the individual, the group, the classes, the massives, that as they receive, as they have gained in this experience. So when he's talking here, they've, they've been associated in various experiences in the earth. So he's talking about past lifetimes that they had together. And that from these lifetimes, they've gathered things that are going to prepare them for this group and for the, the work that they're going to be doing through this group. And that eventually, they'll take it to the classes and the masses um, and that, uh, that this is very important work. And so he goes on in this, oh, I'm sorry. And then um, later that evening, he had a dream after they had this first study group um, reading with these people gathered. He had a dream either that night or the following night. I'm sorry, I'm not, can't remember exactly when. And it told him that this new work was not going to be complete unless they had a separate group of seven and he named the seven in the dream that were to do a separate work along with this study group work um, and were to be, uh, which would focus on healing and prayer. Um, and they're referred to um, in general as the prayer group. And so this group of people who um, has already uh, gathered together and are going to have a pretty big job ahead of them, seven other people find out, well, you've got some extra things that you're going to be doing as well. And so he gathers together to, um, to ask about this dream um, and whether or not it really needs to happen and, or whether it was emblematic, whether it was symbolic. And he said, no, it actually needs to happen. And so this is the first reading that was given to the prayer group. Uh, on October 5th, 1931. And when you, I think that part of the reason why they might have started giving these readings is if you look in actually even the second and third of the study group readings, you'll find them asking about the healing group. So this was a very small group of people that apparently shared a lot. Of, uh, there wasn't a lot of information that didn't uh, in various ways get to all of the members of the group. Um, and so in this one, uh, <clears throat> Gertrude Casey says, we, the group designated as the healing group, have gathered here to seek through these channels to know why and how we are fitted to carry on this special part of the work. Please guide us, please guide us into the right path that we may know thy will and be used to do thy work. And their response. Each, as are gathered here, are fitted in their own particular way for a portion of that work designated by the group as the healing group. In each experience of the individual gathered here, they, the individuals, have contacted various other individuals in experiences in life, some for weal, some for woe, as has been designated to each in those experiences where either development or retardment has been the portion of that individual experience. So in the second paragraph here, he's telling them that some of you have come together, some for weal, some for woe. So sometimes it was a good experience. Sometimes it wasn't that great of experiences and experience. And in some of the lifetimes where you were together, some of you grew and some of you not so much. And then he continues. As these individuals then have contacted others, these that have that karma, that experience to be worked out together for some definite purpose other than that of self-indulgence, self-gratification, or self-exaltation. In some, this has been the last experience. Hence, there is seen that there will be those characterizations in the association when turned to earthly conditions. So here he's talking about that this group of people does have karma or they do have past life experiences with each other. And in the readings, and particularly in the prayer group, we talk a lot about this, what our past relationships may have been with one another. And it is always referred to as a learning experience. It's never a negative or a positive 
um, particularly in the prayer group, because in the prayer group readings, we're told that all of our experiences are for our highest good, or for us to learn something that can be applied for our highest good. So they're also told here that you do have some past experiences with each other, and that when you came together before, maybe some of you got a little bit too involved in yourself and maybe what your talents and gifts may have been. Uh, and he's sort of giving them a warning that if you go back into this, you may not be successful. And the source goes on to say, then there are those experiences with the group as a whole where the greater portion have worked together for the common good of all. So it wasn't always where everyone was thinking for themselves. They did work together uh, for a greater purpose as well. So he's giving them a little pat on the back. Then there are those contacts where there was healing brought in individual experience with the divine forces manifested in a material world. So some of them actually have had some experiences with individual healings, um, either for themselves or possibly uh, for others. Then again, the group as a whole and the dispensing of an ideal as was designated in a material plane through that leading of one through whom sources of information may be given to each that will assist and aid in all phases of their experience in the present. And this is talking about how when they gathered as a group, they did have, um, Edgar Casey had been a leader to them before. Um, he had been as Rata, many of you are aware of that experience in Egypt. And what I'm gonna talk about is the Persian legacy. Um, and so the prayer group and the study group, they had, a lot of them had experiences in Egypt, um, and then again in Persia, and then again, um, with uh, Jesus who became the Christ, um, who uh, the, the um, prayer group readings refer to as the master or the pattern that we are to follow. And so they had these series of experiences together. And they had a person who was leading the way, who was giving them a source of information. It refers to a source of information that's gonna be given to each of you. Um, and that's going to help you with everything that it is that you're going to need to do. So it was a comforting thing, I'm sure. Um, I can't imagine what a daunting task that must have been um, to be told that you as a group um, were basically going to be responsible for um, not only carrying on this work that Edgar Casey had done through his lifetime, but that you had millennia upon millennia upon millennia of other experiences where you were trying to come to, for, to fruition here to actually do this at this time. And, <clears throat> and so we go on to the last of this reading then, as may be seen, these are the ways, the manners, in which each are fitted and fitting themselves by the one common purpose, to be a manifestation of his love in this particular experience. As they fit themselves in their respective niches in this ideal, this purpose, this aim, are these, as a group, designated as those who, with an individual, may lose self in love and service to others. And so this, um, when I was reading over this again, um, I, I again felt like it was a comforting sort of thing. Um, that, uh, because when you go back to some of the, um, the uh, conversations and some of the correspondence, between the study group members and Edgar Casey and the prayer group members. And you can also see it in some of the individual readings as well. There were questions about, are you sure? <laughs> you sure you got the right person here? Maybe, maybe this isn't really for me. Um, and again and again, they were told that even if you feel like you're not prepared at this point, if you continue to follow, and this was the study group teachings, if you continue to follow and work with this material, you'll be given everything that you need. 
<clears throat> and so, like I said earlier, um, I was, so I was really interested in what these past lives were. Um, these were the first two initial readings that were given and there was a hint of them. And then as you go further and further into the material, you see that um, many of the uh, study group members and the prayer group members got life readings. Um, and so they started comparing and contrasting and where were you and I was here and this was, and so it became of great interest to them. Um, and so I thought, oh, wouldn't it be neat to sort of see where everything intersects and who came where and did whatever. And so I started to try to do that. And it kind of sort of looks like this. <laughs> um, there's a lot of weaving it in and out. Some people weren't included in any of those three. Um, uh, any of those three before, uh, previous lives uh, and came into this work. So it's really, really fascinating and interesting. Because I thought, oh, they're all going to intersect and weave, and it's going to be this beautiful, that's a fake graph from the internet, but I was thinking, oh, it's going to be this beautiful thing, and it will make sense, and, and all will be revealed. And no, it's really just, as most of our past lives and our lives with each other and our relationships with each other, they're complicated, they're messy, they're in and out, they're woven. And so one of, they focus primarily in the prayer group, and I think because uh, of the um, more so of the more defined um, healing uh, and the temples that were done in Egypt. Um, the 281 series uh, focuses a lot on the Egyptian time um, and how they came together and what they did, um, but not so much on um, the Persian, and then again, of course, on the time that they spent with Jesus um, and what a lot of their relationships were and what the teachings were there. Um, but there aren't too many references. I was going back, and there are a lot of readings, um, to see if there had been, and if there are some glad helpers in the audience that remember some references to Persia. Um, there may be some slight references, but not so much. So it was sort of fascinating to me, and I think that probably the reason that I didn't do it before is because I could never figure out how to pronounce the name. <laughs> And I thought, well, I'm really not sure if I want to even get there if I can't even pronounce the person's name. So um, if you're interested, I'm going to go very um, sort of quickly over, well, not very quickly, but this is very, as you saw the graph, it's very complicated. The story is interwoven. Um, there are, I'm going to try to weave in, if I can remember, because it gets very complicated. There were people from Egypt who affected this life in Persia. Um, and, um, and so um, I'm going to go over it very briefly and not in a lot of great detail. If you're interested in getting it in greater detail, Kevin Tedeschi wrote a wonderful book. I think it, is it still in print? Um, the Persian Legacy. And it gives you, and I use this as a reference material, it gives you a lot of information, as well as a really beautiful appendix um, that Hugh Lynn Casey wrote. Um, it's a narrative, a, a fictional story of the, the Persian legacy and of the, um, of the story. Um, he was, um, as I'm told, quite fascinated with this time period. Um, and in Kevin's book they talk about he traveled actually um, to Iran um, once or twice, um, I think, to try to find uh, some of the artifacts that we're going to talk about later. So this is ancient Persia, sort of the, you can sort of get um, a, a sense of where it is. Um, there's Egypt there and then Greece. And um, another great reference book that this um, O King, O Ewalt came from is um, W.H. Church's Many Happy Returns, The Lives of Edgar Cayce, which I think is now just called The Past Lives of Edgar Cayce. I think there's a title change, but I'll make sure that um, I let you know and we'll have it available at the table so that you know exactly what's um, available and in print. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, this supposedly occurred according to uh, the readings in 8058 BC. The 58 came because Gladys added it. They, in the readings it specifies that it was 8000 BC, but it also in the readings talk about significant dates being on 58. And so Gladys thought that this was a significant era so that it should have been 8058. That's just sort of a side note. And so um, the <clears throat> where Ewalt comes from, um, he was uh, 
the son of um, his parents were from the tribes of Ra and Zu. Uh, I'm not sure if the Ra is, is part of the Egyptian uh, story of before with Ra Ta, um, but they were in uh, parts of what were Egypt. So he has a, a basis, his family basis actually came from Egypt. And then they were Bedouins, so they were nomadic peoples. Um, and they traveled um, and they were warring factions against one another. They stole cattle from each other. Um, they often stole women from each other. So there, it wasn't always a peaceful um, existence in the desert. And so um, his mother, Ewalt's mother and father got together um, and prayed and made a decision that they would like to bring forth a channel of peace someone who could bring um, peace to all of the factions, all of the different tribes. And so the result was Ewalt. They had um, several other, they had two other children, and again, I might butcher these names, so I apologize if I do, but they had a, um, a second son. Oh, and Ewalt means exaltation, which I thought was really nice as well. Um, they had two other sons. Um, they had Ewalt, and then they had Ouija. If there are people out here who study this and know what it is, yell it out, and I'll be happy to pronounce it correctly. Um, and then they had a third son, Ulato. Um, so they had the three sons. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me. And so um, the first son, Ewalt, was um, somewhat of a more quiet, um, introverted, more, uh, they talked about he had a lot of interest in mystical teachings, um, which had been brought over from some of his parents' um, family. Um, and uh, apparently, uh, when the second son was born, Ouija, the father totally forgot that he really wanted to have a son that was gonna be a channel of peace, and connected with the second son as a warrior and was very interested in making sure that he succeeded and was the best warrior possible. So we have those two things. It sounds like, you know, families that I am in. You have these two competing things. There's not a lot of mention of the third son, but he eventually comes back with Ewalt. So I have a feeling that he was sort of more leaning towards the peaceful side of the family. Um, and um, Ouija is such a good um, a soldier and warrior that he decides that he is going to uh, do a raid uh, against the king of Persia in his royal court, which has never happened before. Um, he does not consult his older brother, who supposedly is the leader of their tribe. Um, and he's also heard, this, the second son, has heard that the most beautiful maidens are in this royal court. And so um, he has decided that, that in order to show the king that their tribe is the best, that they will go, they will raid his royal court and take all of the maidens that are there. Um, he goes in, he does this, he is successful. Um, however, during the raid, um, they not only capture all of the um, all of the, the king's maidens in the court, they also capture his daughter. Um, and several of the girls are killed during the, um, during the raid. Uh, a couple of them were sexually assaulted as well, so it just was not a very pleasant picture. And um, he came back um, and uh, thinking that he had done this great thing um, and actually, sorry, um, and came back to his older brother, Ewalt, and actually offered, the daughter's name was Aaliyah, or Elia, and actually offered um, this maiden to his older brother, sort of as a peace offering, um, to sort of smooth things over. Um, and Ewalt was disgusted um, and very upset and um, said that he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so he took Aaliyah as a bride and um, they had a baby, Inks, Inksa, Inksa, I-N-X-A, a baby girl. Um, and Aaliyah was so distraught by everything that happened um, that she killed herself while she was still nursing the baby. Um, so that was a great tragedy as well. So among all of this 
uh, tumult going on within his own family, as well as there were still warring amongst, there were people that wanted to be peaceful, there were people that wanted to be warriors, so there was a lot of, t of, <coughs> of confusion and chaos going along as well. And so Ewell decided that he um, would uh, go back and, um, to Egypt and study some of the teachings um, that his father's, his mother and father's uh, people had done. And so apparently he went back and learned those mystic teachings. We always hear about those mystic teachings. They never really say exactly what they were, and that's probably because they're different for each of us. So if we globbed onto one of them, we might, might not be the right one for us. Um, so he went and did the mystic teachings and then came back. Um, and his tribe, his family was still in turmoil. He learned of the suicide of his sister-in-law um, and decided that he really needed to, um, to go to the king himself and to try to make a, a peace treaty. Um, and so by himself, dressed just as a Bedouin um, on a horse, he went to visit the king of Persia. And along the way, right before he got to the, um, the king's court, he stopped and there was a well. And so he stopped to get water, and at this well was, of course, oh, that went too fast, sorry, was a, um, a maiden who just happened to be a friend of Aaliyah who had been kidnapped beforehand, the king's daughter, and had known of these Bedouin tribes um, and did not like them, of course, because she had heard of, um, of this great tragedy and it was one of her friends who had actually experienced it. Um, and although she had an attraction to this Bedouin um, because, again, they had had a previous lifetime in Egypt and had actually been twin souls, um, she decided to not focus on that and to take revenge. And so she went ahead of Yuwut and told the king that he was coming. Um, and when he arrived, he was arrested um, and imprisoned. And um, I think it was a few days later, she realized that they were actually supposed to be together, that they were destined to be together. And she, as most great love stories do, um, and, and she, along with her, um, they said it was a nursemaid in some things, and in other things it's, it's more of her companion or someone who actually teaches and guides her. And so along with um, her, um, her teacher, another woman decide that they're going to have to free him. And so they um, are given permission because she is a friend of the royal family to go in and speak to him. And while she's there, she loosens the, she and her, um, her friend loosen the, um, the chains that he's in. And he is able to escape. And his horse miraculously has been waiting for him all these times, just like in the Westerns. The horse has been waiting for him, and so as he goes over this great turret, he has to fall, I mean, several stories. He falls, he's injured, his, apparently his leg was broken at the time. He suffered several other injuries. Miraculously, his horse is there. He gets on to his horse, and as he is um, getting away, he looks back at the castle, and the guards have pushed both of the women off of the castle, and they too have fallen and are injured. And so instead of saving himself, he goes back to um, help these women who initially turned him in, but then helped him. Um, and apparently the nursemaid was so um, broken up that he had to actually physically lift her up and put her onto the horse, her body on the horse, and then got, and he rode in between them, holding on to both of them and keeping this. And so they rode away and they escaped. And as they were escaping, they were stoned. So they were injured even after they had fallen. So it makes it sound like they were severely, severely injured. It wasn't just a little scrape. 
and they were able to find, um, after traveling on the horse, they found a grotto with a waterfall, and it sounds, in the readings, it sounds like a very beautiful place. Um, and there they decided that he decided that he would use the healings and the teachings that he had learned in Egypt um, to heal them. And so they were praying and meditating. And what I found interesting about the story was that the nursemaid um, didn't believe in all that and was actually very crotchety because she had been brought into this whole thing to begin with. And um, the readings say she didn't heal very well. It took her a long time, and in fact, she had many injuries that um, carried on out her life. But miraculously, the two were healed. Um, and I think it's either a three or a seven day span that they were completely and totally healed. Um, and this was actually the spot that Hugh Lim, when I was talking about when he went to travel, that was the spot that he was actually looking for. Um, because apparently there was some uh, a story that perhaps that the bones um, had been buried back in that grotto um, and, and he would be able to find the actual bone that had instantaneously healed. Um, <coughs> sorry, I got a little sidetracked there. Um, so they find this grotto and <coughs> they go into this healing Oh, I'm sorry, I've got, had those reversed. That's supposed to be Elia. She's not very happy that the Bedouin came. Um, and they find this, uh, they, um, <coughs> the two of them fall in love um, and they decide um, that actually while they're in this healing grotto that they are going to come together in a union and create a child. Um, and that they wanted it to be, again, a, a master of peace um, and of healing um, and through that encounter, they had Zend, which is actually, uh, according to the readings, one of the, um, the uh, reincarnations of uh, the Christ. Um, he came in as Zend and did Zoroaster, I can never say it, Zoroasterism, <laughs> is, is what he, actually it was his son who actually came up with that. And the interesting fact about that, um, when I was listening to a, a Hugh Lin um, lecture, he said, yeah, the Christ consciousness, had, he had every, God had everything covered because he had all, most, of the Roman, uh, most of the Roman soldiers studied Zoroastrism, um, <clears throat> which was Zen, which was one of the master's incarnations. And then the other one he got as when he came through as Jesus the Christ. So I just thought that that was very interesting. It's covering all bases. And that also was one of the, I believe, one of the first um, uh, uh, of the religions that talked about um, God being one. And that was something that carried on throughout all of these uh, periods as well. So they create this city called Ishshalan Doan. Um, which is now considered close to Shastar, Iran, I think is how you uh, pronounce it. So, um, and this was a, a great city. Um, he had, um, it was a great city of trade and of commerce. It was an open city where you could come and trade. Um, the, there was a justice system, there was a legal system there so that there was a system of justice. Um, and it was open to all. Um, and the main focus of the city was as a healing art center. And so they had all of these different, um, they actually created a hospital as well. And, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. They had a hospital, which again is similar to the Egyptian time. Um, and so, what started happening was there was a great influx of all kinds of people. And in one of the stories that I read is that people would actually come and drop off people, sort of the undesirables, people who were dying or people that, you know, that, and, and they were welcomed into the city. And, um, and the king of Persia didn't like this. There was free trade, there was free commerce that was sort of interloping on um, some of the trade that he was doing. And he just didn't like the, the whole fact of the justice system. There was just a lot of things that, that he um, 
wasn't really interested in. And so he, along with the Greeks, started trying to send in people to undermine the kingdom. And what would happen was that they would send these people in and most of them would become members of the community. They enjoyed it, they liked it, and they became members of the community. So they were having a really hard time trying to even invade this city. Um, and the other remarkable thing about this city was even though it was a peaceful city, um, the king of Persia tried to attack it several times um, to no avail. And so um, eventually what happened was they had a great influx. There were some, um, uh, eventually the Greeks came and um, there was some um, subterfuge um, and um, Ilya and Ewalt decided that they were going to take a trip back to where uh, she was born. And um, <clears throat> when she did, there was a group, I think it was a group of Greeks waiting for them. They were working with the king of Persia and they beheaded both of them or killed both of them. Um, and they must not beheaded both of them because they, um, the <clears throat> Um, they had marks. This was actually Edgar Casey was Ewalt and Gladys Davis was Ilya. And so they had marks um, on them, which the reading substantiated and they substantiated from those where they were killed. And so it ended up that they, the, um, it was a very not so um, nice ending. Um, and <clears throat> The city went on for a little bit, but then it ended up because again they had factions again, and it came uh, it came uh, to be destroyed in the end. Um, and but Edgar Casey was told when he was given his readings for this lifetime that this was actually um, in Persia was where he really uh, really honed in on um, what he was able to do with the readings. Um, that he was able to cast the carnal mind aside so that there speaks then as the oracles or to, or, or to that the throne. I think that's a typo, I'm sorry. So this was where he really learned how to separate self so that he could um, speak to the, the divine. And what I also thought was interesting that right after that, yet he faltered in the next return and the next return to earth. So even after this great period <laughs> of, uh, <clears throat> of peace and of healing, yet again, he faltered and he faltered again. Um, and then we know that he comes back um, with the master and then um, after the master, he again has several lifetimes where he's only thinking of self. Um, but it was this lifetime where they said that he um, really got um, the, the, the talent um, that he had of giving the readings. Um, and so, uh, like I said, with the prayer group, one of the reasons, I, it is a beautiful and lovely story, it's very romantic. Um, well, some of it, not the ending, is not that romantic. I um, mean, there are all these twists and turns and it sounds, it's very salacious. Um, and so I think that there was a little bit of that too um, with, these, with these life readings. I mean, I can't imagine you know what, we went back, if you go back to those slides where we've got the Pharaoh and everything, you know, some of those people were told that they were great leaders and kings and, and then they were given some readings that weren't so great. So we have our ups and downs throughout, um, but we're still able to uh, achieve great things. Um, and so in the prayer group, um, there actually was a lot of, um, they had a lot of internal, not turmoil, but where they were trying to figure out where was their place, where is my place, and I'm sure that that happened in the study group as well. I'm not familiar with the, the ins and outs of the study group as I am with the prayer group, but I'm sure that a lot of it was where do I fit in, where, what are my talents that I'm supposed to be bringing, am I good enough, what is it that I'm supposed to be, you know, <clears throat> what am I, how am I supposed to be creating this this new, um, this new way of living is basically the way that, they've, that it's been told to them, that if you can yourself go through this and give your personal experiences, because that's what they were tasked with doing, you couldn't just 
read the book or read the material. They didn't have the book at that time, but you couldn't just read the reading and then sort of comment it on it the next week. <laughs> that wasn't happening. You had to write down all of your personal experiences. They were given a reading list. And, you know, so, I mean, this was, they were given homework, if you sort of think about it. And then they had to come back and the source kept telling them, you know, you, it wasn't like you could get out of it. The source would say, all right, some of you have not done your homework and we're not moving on until you all finish it. So there is that, there is that tension of, um, with the Casey readings that we know, and, it, and that goes back into this reincarnation, is that none of us are going to move forward until all of us move forward. Ah, oh, see anybody's ah. <laughs> so, so again, this is a prayer group reading. You can see that it's about ten years into it, um, and there's still this. Actually, is a reading. And you can see I, the reason that I put the people that were present was because I thought it was interesting because there weren't that many people. Uh, it was just Edgar Casey, Gertrude Casey, Gladys Davis, Beverly Simmons, Ruth Denny, and May Verhoeven. And these were members who were very interested, apparently, in their past lives reading. It came up that they were physicians. And so they were fascinated by how the body worked. And so there is a whole, which I'm glad that we have this material, but there is a whole section in, those of you in the Glad Helpers are going, yes, we know the section, about the endocrine system that is very, very detailed about how it works and it talks about conception and, and all of these things. And so um, they are asking about the endocrine system and how it works and that kind of thing. And the source pops up with this, which I thought was very interesting. In answering questions, it is well that all members of the group, as well as those present, analyze their own experiences in the light of that which has been, may be, or will be given respecting the manners in which they may each use such information as a helpful influence, first in their own experience, and then in assisting others to understand their purposes, their desires, physically, mentally, spiritually, in human relationships. And so what he's saying here is that you don't need to know how everything works. <laughs> you know, you don't have to have all of, and you don't need to know, like in general, well, you need to have an overall uh, idea of how things work, but everything is going to be different for you. Your experience with this material is going to be different. And primarily that's because you have had all of these past lives experience which have sort of flavored what you're doing now. And so one thing that might reach somebody here is not going to reach this person over here. And so that's one of the things that I think is so beautiful about the ARE as well is that when people come here, they expect that everything, everybody's going to say the exact same thing, like we're some sort of cult or something where we're just going to give you this line about here's this, 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 and this. And you come here and there are people from all different backgrounds, uh, of all different religious persuasions, with all these different ideas. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, a little challenging because we have that, but it's also um, very interesting. And I think that, that that is the legacy that we've been given is that we're allowed to be ourselves as we are, knowing that we're striving towards something bigger. And so and then in this question, they actually talk about reincarnation further in this reading about the endocrine system. And the question was put, in giving that as may be understandable in the study of man, is it necessary to understand that purpose for which an entity decided to enter the earth plane from the first creation of that entity. So what they're asking is, do I have, because now they, they're talking about past lives, and they're talking about how your past lives influence your current life. And so I'm sure, particularly when they have the source, they're like, okay, do I need to know A to Z? Do I need to know about every single life I had? Because I'm gonna have to make some additional appointments to get some more readings. Um, you know, so, <clears throat> and, he, and the answer is this. This is too far-reaching to be answered yes or no. For each experience of a soul entity in materiality is part of the whole experience of the entity. Each inception, 
each conception upon which the soul depends for its period of manifestation is as but a moment, a day, a year in the activity of the entity itself. Thus, it could not be said that an individual conception is a beginning. It is a part of a whole, from those activities first conceived in mind, and there is no time in spirit. See. We talked about in the prayer group, when he says see, I always think that's something really important and probably a little complicated that you're going to have to read several times before <laughs> you under really grasp um, the depth of it. But to me, this is saying that you, you come in whole, you know, and we'll get to another reading that talks about that, but that all of your past lives are just like a blink of an eye um, in your total experience. And some of them may have a, a large effect on you in this lifetime, and some of them may not. But that from your conception, when you were conceived as that soul, you were whole. And in this reading, and so with the study group, information and with the prayer group reading, we're always trying to be our best, our highest self. I shouldn't say our best self because that's not. We're trying to be our higher self, trying to connect with that higher self. And Casey himself, in all of his past life reading, was told that one of, one of his greatest downfalls was not watching self go by, was not taking note of what happened in the past as well as what was happening now. And so I think that it's kind of ironic that that's like the big thing of study group is that you study yourself and daily, well, sometimes more than daily, you watch yourself go by. <laughs> so this is a reading that was given um, and they were asking basically the best method of helping the human family increase in the knowledge of the subconscious soul or the spirit world. And this is fairly early, it's 1924. So this is before the study group readings or, or any, th any of that um, was given. So it's sort of a flavor of what's to come. Excuse me. And the answer is the knowledge of the subconscious of an entity or an individual in or of the human family is as of one integral force or element or self in the creation of the human family. And until the entity or individual as individuals makes this known to groups, classes, countries, nations, the greater study of self, that force will only be magnified. That of the spirit is the spark or portion of the divine that is in every entity, whether complete or of the evolution to that completeness. That was one of the one things that I really liked because it talks about you have that spark. You have the divine within you, whether you are complete or so nicely, whether you are on the evolution to that completeness. And this is, it's a fairly long reading, but I think it's, it's a nice one and it sort of goes with my closing thoughts as well. Um, <clears throat> this is the same reading. The study from the human standpoint of subconscious, subliminal, psychic soul forces is and should be the great study for the human family. For through self, man will understand its maker. When it understands its relationship to its maker, and it will only understand that through itself. And that understanding is the knowledge as is given here in this state. And so this reading is talking about, you know, you're going to find the divine through yourself and only through yourself. And the Casey readings tell us that as well. It is that small, sometimes soft voice, <laughs> sometimes not so soft voice within. And because that divine spark is within, that is where you meet it. And the Casey readings talk about that as being prayer and meditation, and that's how you meet that. 
and that the ending there and, and the understanding and this knowledge is going to only come through this period right now, this moment right now, that every moment you are in, you have the capacity to get that understanding and knowledge from the divine. Each and every person getting that understanding has its individual force toward the great creation and its individual niche, place, or unit to perform. So each of us has our own place, just like he said in the group, in those original groups, that we each have our own job, our own place, our own niche to fill, and we have to find out what that is. Has to reach numbers of psychic forces or phenomena that may ma be manifested in the earth plane all the same. Yet the understanding for the individual entity, viewed from its own standpoint with its knowledge, is obtained and made ready by itself to be manifested through itself towards its own development and in that development of the creation or world. So we have all that we need within ourselves to do what we need to do to do our part in creating this new world, this new consciousness. And in this manner and in this form and in this way will the development to study the force as given through this manner be of assistance to the world. So just as with the first study group, as they learned about, our, as they learned about themselves, each of us is called to learn about ourselves and how we want to manifest the divine into the physical world. And we're not all going to do it in the exact same manner. And this is a nice one also from the study group readings, and they were asking about reincarnation on past lives. And it was given, when one considers the birth of a soul into the earth, the more often is the body and the body-mind considered than the soul. That is full grown in a breath. And so that's talking about that completeness, that you are, I am. And then all of these experiences that you've had in your past lives are going to color what you're working with now because we know that they were lessons for us. And sometimes, we passed the lesson, sometimes we didn't do so well. But again, the readings give us that try, you know, that the righteousness is really in the try. And that's what I love when I go back and I read this material from the study group and from the prayer groups. And because I have gotten to know these individual people, I know you know, that they were housewives or there was a tugboat captain in one of them, they all had this individual life that they were leading. And they were asked what seems to be this almost incomprehensible task, you know, to bring light to a waiting world. Not only did you have to generate that light, but the world was waiting for it. They needed it. There was an urgency to it. it took them 11 years to finally get that first book. But they kept trying. They kept trying. And so that, I think, is a legacy to all of us. At the end of Edgar Casey's life, many of the members and had the past knowledge of the past lives that they had had together. And they knew of the miraculous healings that had happened. And actually, those of you who are familiar with the Egypt readings know that Rata was rejuvenated, completely and totally physically rejuvenated. And so many of the members of the group were hoping that that would be the case this time. And of course, um, we know that Edgar C Casey passed. He was um, physically, I think, just worn out um, from all the readings that he um, had given uh, during World War II. Um, and I think that part of that, um, from doing the studies that I've been doing, it. For me, he had a pers Edgar Casey had a personal goal um, of getting that life's work of the hospital built and using his talent for giving those health readings to help heal others. 
And when that was taken away, he felt like he didn't have a mission. And then he realized that he could actually become transpersonal, that the information that he could give didn't have to be, even though it was given to a specific individual and very specific, it had a greater meaning. Um, and so he sort of opened up into that. And I think that all of these lifetimes that he had with this group of people was what actually allowed him to manifest the lifetime that he had here. And I think that some of that, um, once you realize, and what we've talked about before is that we're all part of this unit, that we're all a, an integral piece of the pie. And so I felt, I, I feel like reading some of his letters and things that Edgar Casey maybe felt that if he could help just that one more individual with their pain and with their suffering, with all of the, the people that were missing and were lost, if he could just help one more person, maybe that would be a contribution to the whole. And I think also that he realized that he had completed his work, that he had this group of people around him who were dedicated and who had decided that they were going to continue this work. Um, and if we learn anything from the story of Persia, even though it's a beautiful story, we know that that city, that place, was a shining light on the hill. And this building and these buildings in this place are still a shining light on the hill, still provides a beacon to those who are seeking to know his face. And so although it's important for us to know how, where we were, who we might have been in past lives, the most important thing is how you're using those tools that you've learned in your past life in this very moment? How are you contributing to the whole? How are you spreading the light of this work? And so I can't close without saying one of the ways you may be able to do this is to join a study group, <laughs> if you haven't already. Um, you know, I feel like in many ways, Edgar Casey knew that he, in, in, in many of these lifetimes, that he was just waiting for his tribe to come. And so I feel like here at the ARE, sometimes when we feel like, so many of us feel like there's just too much. It's too much. It's too much in the world right now. I can't do all of it. There's no way. We know that we each just have a very small part to play. And if we do our best playing that part, that's all that we're required to do. And we can all be lights on the hill. So what I'd like to do in closing is just do a very brief meditation, if you would indulge me to do so. And just take a moment, get your feet on the floor. Take some nice deep breaths. My stepmom has a little plaque, and I'm going to paraphrase some of what it is while we go into meditation. And it says, Each morning arise and lean thine arm on the windowsill of God. And looking out that window, see God's light. And know that you have the strength to start the day. Amen. Thank you all. Are there any questions before we? Okay. Thank you all. 
We ended a little bit earlier than we should. Some of you might be glad about that. Some of you may not be. Um, and I will have the, um, the book titles available in the back. If you're interested in receiving the PowerPoint presentation in its entirety, I can email it to you. If you'll just let me know when there's a little sign-up sheet at the back, if you'll just put a little asterisk beside your name, I'll know that you are wanting to receive the PowerPoint in its entirety. So you have some time. Um, there is, uh, Gary, do you have any announcements that you want to make or? I am. Okay. All right. Enjoy New Year's. Good morning. I have suggested to you today that I would be able to straighten you out completely within the next hour and 15 minutes. I'm going to keep it. Now, <laughs> all that will happen here, of course, and all that has happened this week is to provide you with some insight hopefully, that has come out of the education readings, as I understand them, been combined with some of the thinking and the work of psychologists and psychiatrists and religious leaders. It's what we've tried, many of us, uh, and have found helpful. And our telling you, our sharing with you, won't help until you put it into practice, into operation, until you work with it. There's a whole section here in the Faces of Fear. <laughs> when I start talking about books, I'm reminded of a crazy, egotistical thing that once happened that really broke up a film. I was uh, doing an interview with uh, Doc, uh, with uh, David E. Kahn, who was an old, old friend of my father's. Met him when he was 15 years old. Knew him almost as long as I did. Great help. Dave was a member of the board and very helpful through the years. In fact, was probably responsible for the tremendous diversity of people and kinds of people of the education reading because he would call up from anywhere over the country that he was selling furniture, carloads of furniture, and with every carload of furniture, he would sell a reading. And uh, he'd call Dad up and uh, have him get a reading on somebody Dad had never heard of, name and address, and he was sending the name and everything in with a request. You always got the request from the person, but some member of the family or something, and... Uh, it ended up with Dad giving readings for people all over the place. Well, I was doing this interview. Dad met him when he was 15 years old back in Lexington, Virginia, Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, we were opening, and Dad had dedicated a special book, uh, There's a River, a pre-publication issue of it uh, today, his old friend. And I had a copy of... Uh, the bears of over there, and we were filming this interview. And I'd gone over it, and we got it all straight, and I opened it up, and I said, Dave, uh, I noticed that my father, I have a book here of yours that he gave you, a special edition of Bears of River that he dedicated, you know, gave you the first copy of. Uh, this excellent book on his life, uh, Venture Inward. <laughs> the one I'd written <laughs> and uh, yeah I was holding there is a river and so we had to black up and start all over again so when I start talking about books I, if I shift titles around and names I don't bother uh, 
there is a section here in uh, Faces of Fear, the whole last part that deals with this business of how to work with anxieties and uh, fears. It's called Putting Away Your Fears, and it occupies all the rest of the book. In it, there is a chapter on prayer and meditation. In my opinion, it's the best thing I've written on prayer and meditation. But there is a great deal that's available uh, from the ARE on prayer and meditation, and I'm going to share that with you at the end of this little part on meditation and prayer. I want you to... Uh, I know many of you pray and meditate, and so I'm going to jump right into the middle of it, not into an ABC. And if you have to get the ABCs, you're going to have to get a hold of some of these books that I, I suggest for you. Many of us, when we start working with meditation and prayer, good, would you bring them on up? Thank you, ma'am. We have the questionnaires that I promised you at the beginning of the week, and my good secretary has performed a miracle. <laughs> she printed these all herself, uh, hand by hand done. Actually, she just pushed the press until we got them out. As we start to pray and meditate and persist in it, we begin to be sensitive to the movements of energy in us. We may feel like we're moving a little bit, and it's really the finer body that's moving. We begin to have uh, movements inside of us. And various centers, the gonads, the sexual centers, the adrenal centers, tightness of bands in the throat, all begin to, uh, we get a little effect from. And we are working along and our mind shifts and gets to those centers. And the concentration, the thought even, turn for a few moments there is energizing and uh, the energy moves now this is not what you should be doing with meditation and prayer there is a different kind of route and it's mentioned specifically in the education readings and it happens constantly but as you become really aware of it it becomes a very healing and tremendous experience. It's a movement of energy from the base of your spine instantaneously to the top of your head. That's the backward flowing motion that I'm going to read you something about from another discipline, an ancient discipline, that is parallel to the educated readings. Now, this movement, and it will happen, and you can become aware of what it is, will produce a meeting of energies. There's energy flowing into you all the time. And this is God, it's energy in the universe moving toward man. That hand of Michelangelo's in the Sistine Chapel, those hands are beautiful. Man is reaching just barely, but God is reaching. And this is the movement of these energies. When it hits there, sooner or later you become aware of light. A flooding. It may be a tiny point of light. It may be a flooding of light. It's not a bunch of colors and, and uh, faces and scenes and all of that. That's for the birds. And you've got to go through all of that. But this has to move up, and when that light it's, it produces a peace and a calmness. Be still and know that I am God. And it's a stillness that will be unlike anything you experience. That's where we're going. Now, at that point, 
that energy then combined spills back down. And that is what heals the whole business of the self. It can wipe out instantaneously all of the guilt, all of the drives that are tearing you apart. It can heal your body, your mind, your emotions. And it will if you let it. Instantaneously. Now that's really where you're going. That's the awakening of the tremendous spiritual energy. For in that pineal is the memory stored of the soul relationship to God. The whole revelation, the first chapters of it, deal with the meditation experience that that shows all of these happenings. But the opening of the seven seals, remember it? Now, it's that top seal, the silence, that you're headed for. Go there first, and then let that spiritual energy from outside and your own going home to the creator, so to speak. Let that come back and open and heal and calm the centers that you're working with. Now we pray for this and you work for this. Let me show you what I mean by it expressed in another uh, frame of reference. It's a magnificent book called The Secret of the Golden Flower. I've, a lady introduced me to it many, many years ago, and I have blessed her in my prayers ever since. Uh, it may be that I just was an old Chinese running around over there and got a great deal of help all the, out of that, and I got back to it. But listen, The Secret of the Golden Flower. This motion that I've just described is called the backward-flowing motion. In the moment of release, it is not allowed to flow outward, but is led back by the force of thought so that it penetrates the crucible of the creative and refreshes and nourishes the heart and the body. This is the backward-flowing method of meditation. The seed blossom of the human body, he's talking about the energy, you can call it anger, hate, fear, sex, whatever you want to call it. We use it in lots of different ways. One energy. That seed blossom is concentrated upward in the empty space. Immortality is contained in this sentence. And also the overcoming of the world, our world, is contained in it. This is the common goal of all religions. Now, the education readings and the Taoist treaties develop this direct way, this backward-flowing motion. Education mentions the cells of light in the gonad area and the movement that goes direct to the pineal and then spills over into the pituitary, and then the changes can occur. That's where you're going with meditation. Don't climb up the ladder center by center or you will knock yourself for a loop and not be able to handle the resulting chaos that spills out of your unconscious and I'm seeing it and it's seen it happen again and again and again this is the danger of slipping as the Taoists call it into the world of fantasy this is one of the most beautiful statements about it that I've found anywhere. To concentrate the seed flower of the human body above in the eyes. That's the center here that the pituitary is pulling into the pineal and then down. Uh, above there, that is the great key of the human body. Children, take heed. If for a day you do not practice meditation, this light streams out. Who knows whether? Well, you know whether now and then it goes. 
if you only meditate for a quarter of an hour. By it, you can do away with 10,000 eons. That's karma, memory, and a thousand births. That's cutting down on the number you need. All methods end in quietness. Now, how do you do that? You say, fine, that sounds beautiful. But uh, I get diverted. I meditate, try to meditate, and my mind goes out all over the place. I meditate, and uh, all kinds of things happen to me, and I see faces, I see scenes, which are lights. Uh, is that? No, that's not meditation. That's all that business of the lower centers. Opening up. Don't play with it. Go to the top. And it can happen if you persist. And at that point, when it happens first, you have put your foot on the first ramp of the ladder of deep meditation. But you're on your way. Now, I'd like to suggest three approaches to this. It is so important that you begin to put into action into daily activity, uh, this business of, uh, of the focus on the affirmation. You realize that in the search for God, for example, this aff- these affirmations that are there, they are connected with each essay, cooperation, know thyself, what is my ideal. Each one of these deals with a basic spiritual law. And it is suggested that you hold the affirmation. Now, some of them are long, and you can't remember them, so you begin to to get the essence of it. You get a phrase out of it. But each time, your mind and your body, and your body will kick up, and you get thirsty, and wiggle, and hurt, and places you, you itch, and places you never itched before. The body's trying to get your attention. Your mind's trying to get your attention. doesn't intend for you to wake this other because they got turned loose when the master wakes up and begins to run the show. And so you persist. Now, to three steps. Let's say you're an individual and you're out isolated. You, you can't get to a group. I would, let's start with a group though. We have provided uh, a whole study group program that's growing around the world. There are 1,800 of these things. If you can get into one or form one, it is one way to go that is very important. Without it, I couldn't have made it. I have said many times that I think Group 1 saved my father's life after the collapse of the hospital and the university. His work with that group, the readings that he gave, and the beginning of of, uh, that little book. There are 225,000, about 300,000 almost now, uh, copies of a Search for God book one that are out and being studied and read and nobody has ever advertised it once in a newspaper or a magazine or anywhere. It goes from group to group, person to person. And it's on some interesting tables around this world. Now, that contains spiritual laws under different subject headings. Try a group you find that the group is trying to work with meditation and that their prayer will support you and help you. Uh, it gives you somebody to pray for and to work with and to talk with and share with. People that are looking, trying at least, in other directions. It also gives you something else. It's very workable. Uh, some people that you discover that you wouldn't catch yourself with anywhere else but in the study group. But they are great opportunities to learn to, to pray for them and to be prayed for and to begin to love them. And some strange ones show up in these groups, believe me. Opportunities such as you haven't had in a long time. Now, they are almost as good as families. Not as good, but almost as good as spiritual workshops. Dad said this family is the best spiritual workshop. It gives you more opportunities than any other. 
uh, because all your karma shows up generally in the family situation. All your memories from past experiences and relationships. But the group can provide a way, and there are many advantages of it. Uh, you should take a look at the possibility of involving yourself. It will help you in your work with meditation and prayer. It will help you in the discussions and the clarification, and you'll find a lot of people that are willing to listen to you when, uh, and you listen to them. Odd infinitum, once a week. Until you begin to love them and care in ways you didn't realize that were possible before. Now suppose you're an individual. I'd like to suggest two ways of going at this. You're not in a group. You can't get in one. You're moving around or you're in college or you're somewhere else. You can't get at it. What do you do? How do you handle it? Well, you've got to start working with putting energy into sharing the materials that you work with in the ideals that are in each of these lessons. Remember the first one in the Search of God, Book One. Let me be a channel of blessing today, now, to those I contact in every way. You can boil that affirmation down to service, if you like. But it's an ideal that you're going to try to work with. Now, how do you do that? What do you do with your mind to try to carry that out? Let's suggest, for example, that you select one or two or three people that you're going to work with. Uh and try to be of help to. And then you figure out the mental, the physical ideal, how do you go about to do that? The encouragement, the friendliness, the praying form, whatever you can do that relates to those. Then take some more. But during the month that you as an individual are holding that affirmation and working through, then when you start to get into know thyself, then this becomes a real job of trying to understand in that month, who you really are. And as you read the essay, and then begin to meditate every day with using that affirmation related to that one, you can begin to uh, do various things that can help you to see yourself a little better. You may have some friends that can tell you a little bit about yourself. If you've got some kids, ask them. <laughs> They'll tell you, and none, nothing flat what they think. And you see yourself from a different angle. Or if you've got a husband or a wife, uh, they can lay it on you very easily uh, and help you if you will take it in the loving relationship that exists. And so we begin to, we can take tests. We can do all kinds. There's a whole batch of things in here that are suggested for the business of coming to know the self, working with the self. I gave you this morning a little uh, sheet. Uh, you should have it. There are more up here. If any of you don't have it, it's a gland thing. And what it is, is uh, it deals with the gonads, uh, with the Leiden, the adrenals, and the thymus. And it's got a lot of words that are positive, and then it's got a lot of words that are negative in the attitudes and actions about that come out of these glands. The words. Uh, for example, let's take uh, the adrenals. Uh, a positive side of that functioning uh, takes the initiative and is persistent. How persistent are you? Are you never persistent or are you always persistent? Score yourself. Uh, enthusiastic. How enthusiastic are you? Well, you're seldom enthusiastic. You can give yourself a two on that. Or you're habitually. You give yourself a five. You keep scoring each word all the way down. Are you a peacemaker? Or are you, do you have courage? Are you patient? And so forth. All down. But now look at the negative words there. You've got to score yourself with the same number. Uh, how destructive are you in your comments and in your actions and where you're, where you're moving from? Uh, are you easily discouraged? Do you hold back and say, well, maybe. Uh, are you domineering? Are you timid or are you fearful? Too much either one way or the other. Score yourself. Do you get angry, e angry easily? Do you have an uncontrollable temper? Do you hate? Score yourself on these. And then add them up and divide them and you get a picture of how you're functioning 
from the lower centers. Turn over and you find that those are the spiritual centers. And they have danger points too, as you will see. Um, now duplicate this before you write it all out and um, give it to your husband and your wife or your uh, children or a good friend and ask them to score you on it. And don't tell them. Just tell them how to do it. And then compare it with uh, your own. Just another way of looking, knowing the self. There are many ways of taking each of these essays. And if you can't be in a group, beginning to work with them. Now, the third way, where you're not, you're still alone, but you want a more disciplined and an easy way to go, an easier way. It may help you in the beginning. This has just come out. And it's an ARE thing. Uh, uh, Herb and D. Shambaugh put it together, and it is excellent. It uh, has ideals in it and how to put them down, how to work with them, and then a description of how to use the book. And then in it, there's the affirmation and uh, the awakening, quotes from the readings, and then the Bible readings that you can live your prayer list for the, the week, and uh, then a checklist for you uh, to check yourself on, to see uh, what sort of progress. Now, the suggestion for the daily dozen activities includes some very good things. I warn you, don't pick out too many of these all at once or you play out the first two or three, four days. You know, where you at? Meditation daily, that's a good one to hold on to. A morning walk. Add gelatin to salads. Now, it's doing all kinds of things. Straighten you out. I'll read the Bible every day. Eliminate fried foods. Eat three almonds a day. Eat a raw vegetable salad. This is every day now, remember. Uh, dark bread instead of white. Uh, I'm just jumping around. Eliminate carbonated drinks. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> A peanut oil massage every day, my golly. Apple diet, a glass of water, and then he goes on a glass of water all day long. This is eight glasses of water that need for the day. Uh, do a breathing exercise, uh, study a search for God chapter, uh, outreach to a friend, practice eating slowly. Oh boy, it's got all kind of things in here. There's a wonderful checklist. Now, this is called Day by Day, Steps to a New Life. And it's, uh, it came in very handy right here on Friday. It's, uh, it's a very good step. There's one on the front row up here. Oh, you spam one. Prayer and meditation. When you begin to meditate, pray. Pray before and pray after. It doesn't take long. But begin to work with different kinds of prayer. Not just petition all the time. And in the petitionary prayers, don't forget yourself. We frequently forget to pray for ourselves. But there needs to be prayers of praise and adoration, prayers of thanksgiving, and particularly prayers of confession. I gave you one way with that sheet the other day to work with prayers of confession with individuals and situations that you want to change. My secretary will have copy, additional copies of those if you wish to get them. She's, her office is right off of the uh, uh, lobby in the old headquarters building, the hospital building up there. I gave these out early. You pray in order to meditate more effectively. You meditate in order to pray more effectively. At the end of the meditation, don't hold on to this energy. Whether you think it's been raised or not, send it out. 
Pray for somebody. Pray for yourself. Send it out to others. Uh, other members of your study group, if you've got a group, but people that you are working with, that are on your prayer list. Don't ever forget to do that after meditation. We must be persistent. This must become a daily part of one's life for it to make a difference. Not just for a week, just not on Monday and then on Friday again and leave off over the weekend, but regularly. If you will do it, it will change your life without question. You will begin truly to become a new person with a new life. Now, what else? What are the tools for all of this business? This business of, uh, we know, of uh, the blocks. Uh, how do we get rid of There's a major chapter in the right in the beginning of this section, and it's called the Align Your Life with the Law of One. That means that you and I have got to re-examine ourselves. Step aside and watch ourselves go by. Begin to, to look at ourselves more objectively. And be willing to accept and work with our dreams, which become important for us. Uh, along the way, you will find, begin to find that this is one of the great helps. It not only provides you with insight of where you are and what you're really working with, and an insight into yourself that you can't get any other way, but it will provide you experiences that you begin to remember of healing, of movement of your consciousness to other levels that will absolutely convince you as nothing else ever will that you are more than this little piece of flesh and a little conscious mind. You catch yourself in a dream moving out of body once and uh, you won't ever think of yourself the same way. You begin to understand the possible dimensions of this real you. For you and I live, not just here, but we take a third of our time off here to go back in an altered state of consciousness called sleep to other levels of consciousness. And we let the body run itself and heal. And we frequently leave it. And you can become aware of this if you work with the dreams. In this law of one, we're talking about the oneness of all force. We've talked constantly this week about the granular centers and how we mistake the one energy as it moves through different centers for anger or hate or courage or vitality or drive. Uh, we try to separate that and make it different or fear from the energy that we use to be creative with. Or the same energy that we use to be uh, in sex or the same energy we use uh, to feel self-pity, to feel sorry for ourselves. This is all the same energy but moving in different centers. We need to become aware of the oneness of the force that is moving and flowing through us. The meditation that I've described is the best way I know to become fully aware of that. And you can. There's other ways to sense this oneness. Don't miss the simple opportunities that are with you all the time of coming in contact with the creative energy of the universe in its creations. Everything around us. The creative energy created. It 
It's magnificent. It's beautiful. You may be caught with a sunset or a sunrise. Or a walk on the ocean and the ripple of the water or the moon at night over that water. Which can come romantic and beautiful, too, in a different way. Or it may be a sunset or a tree. But you can become aware of the creative power, the oneness of the energies moving through it. For me, it was a tree. And my father pushed me right out the door. I was arguing with him one day. After he had finished telling people about the little people that he saw, group of people, and he sat that story, I'd wondering what in the world. Uh, I'm not sure that he did anything but scare him because he talked about the nature energies that he observed and uh, worked with as a child and had been seeing and sensing and worked with in his gardens. And as I told you, he had two green thumbs. Anything he planted came up. We had the biggest and the best of whatever uh, Eddie Casey worked with. And we had some wild things growing. And I, uh, he'd order strange trees from all over to try them out and talk to them and do all kind of things. Uh, he used to fish off the pier out in the little lake back of the house on Arctic Circle. And so one day he had me out there helping him and we were building a box and lining it with tin and putting tar in it. And then he, he took a, a weeping willow tree, a fairly good sized one, and put it in the box and filled in with good rich dirt. And he tied a rope to that box and he'd pull it out there by the end of the pier so he'd have shade over it. <laughs> and somebody said, a friend of his came by and said, Chase, you think that thing's going to grow in that box? He said, sure, it's going to grow. And it did, luxuriously, beautifully. And he used to tow it out there and pull it back. <laughs> and it's very funny to see that tree floating around out there in the <laughs> middle of the lake. Uh, Dad had the best asparagus and the biggest tomatoes, and every, but all kind of exotic things. We used to have uh, uh, strawberries that just went out of sight. And... Uh, he used to make wine. He loved to make things, make jellies and wines. Never used any preservative in it. But he was very much into nature. Well, after this was over, I said, Dad, my goodness, this talk that he was doing with these people. I said, people don't think you're nuts. You're crazy. I said, people think you're crazy anyway, but they're going to be convinced of it if you keep talking like this. And it got, it, it, it upset him. He got angry. He said, do you mean to tell me that you don't think there's energies in things all around us and that you can see it and feel it and become aware of it? He said, even you can do it. (laughs) He said, now you're not going to eat here until you go out and sit under that tree for 15 minutes and pray and meditate. Well, I'd just begun to start praying and meditating. I didn't know much about it. But that oak tree was out there and I liked to eat. <laughs> and so I went and I sat. He told me I was going to have to do it for 14 days. I was home from college, vacation. And um, I didn't make it 14 days. That tree let me know it was there. I don't said, you know, it didn't say, you Lynn, what are you doing here? <laughs> but it, it, the life in it. I became aware. I was in the aura of the tree. I began to sense the, the flow in the, the roots under me. I was sitting with my back against it. I began to hear and feel the, the movement in the sap moving and the leaves over me. The movement, not the wind, but some other kinds of sounds and movement. And the life of it began to convey itself to me and, and relate to me. And I tuned into it. I've had a thing going with trees since then you wouldn't believe. All over the country. I got some friends. And they're growing. I'm worried about California because some of my friends may get hurt. These big, big trees. I found one, another one out there. That I, I was able to, it, it was able to convey the memory that it had in it. 
And I was meditating under it one day out in California. I used to go there every year. I'd get up enough energy to not have to use a plane. I'd jet back by myself. <laughs> uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, the energy that was available, that pours out and you report, have a rapport with, is terrific. Just wonderful. And so, I was sitting under this big, big uh, redwood. And I began to be aware of an Indian. But it wasn't me. It was a memory of the tree of an Indian who gotten lost from his hunting party. And he was cooking a rabbit right under the tree. And I knew all about it. And I knew how he felt. He was worried over being lost. And uh, uh, the tree had all that contained in it. Amazing uh, energy. In living things. If you come, some of those of you who came to our porch the other night for a study group, they didn't tell you where you were going, so we'd have had more than we, we had a lot of you anyway. But you're surrounded on that porch by living things. My wife talks to them like she talks to our neighbors. And um, I speak to them every once in a while. <laughs> but mine is trees. It's amazing. Don't miss this wherever you can touch it. It will open up a whole new world to you. That is, pulls you into relationship with God. The creative energy of the universe, if you wish. But there's another place you can find this, of course. And many of you have found it. And I've begun to look in many eyes. Looking for the people around the world when I see them to remember the love that I have experienced. Friends. Beautiful, beautiful relationships. Difficult. They bring with them the problems of the friendships of the past. But they are beautiful. And they become as enriching experiences of caring and loving. And it opens an opportunity all over the world. I mentioned one of them to you yesterday, this Mula and Shusta Ron, where we were looking for a cave Dad had described that he'd been buried in back in old Persia. We think he'd located the area and they've thrown us out. We won't go back for a while, I'm sure. But he's there. He's a friend. An old, old friend. And you can find these people around you, close to you, and anywhere you are if you will begin to look and listen. And you begin to know that in all races and in all religions and in all people, God is there as he is in you. And this is essential for us to know. For if he's there, we can begin to love rather than to hate and to feel prejudiced and fear and begin to give up, destroy our fellow man. And when you begin to give this up in your minds, with individuals, that energy pouring through in prayer, energy, and in the attitudes that you assume can change this world, not just this country, but this world. God can do anything to us if we get out of the way. And, let him. and it is essential that we do this, ladies and gentlemen. If this time of crisis is to be handled, you and people like us all over this world must handle it. Are we going down the drain again? And return and start our war with sticks and stones again. 
as we've done so many times. And it is not necessary. But it's up to us. And we go back to get ourselves out of the way. This business of the subject that I was supposed to talk about <laughs> is called controlling the mind, the builder. Uh, it's referred to all through this book, uh, The Experiments in the Search for God by Mark Thurston. Excellent to work with a study group. It's in Elson Seacrest's Gateway to Light. It's all over the place. You can hardly get in the ARE or get, certainly not get out of it, without hearing about the setting of ideals and goals, physical and mental and spiritual goals. And when you begin to do this, then and only then, have you got something to measure against that you can begin to control the thought processes and the words you speak? If you are trying to be patient, and that is your ideal for a while that you're working with, you can keep your mouth shut gradually if you work at it. And that's the physical ideal. Uh, in relationship to Mrs. Jones, who you would like to clock. And you can begin to deal with that discipline of the self if you've got something that you're striving to work with and it's the ideal and the purpose. The controlling of the mind, of course, has to do with stopping feeding the negative emotions. You cannot say, I would like to stop being afraid and keep going to horror movies. It won't work. You keep stimulating it again. It's obvious. You cannot say, I would like to be more loving and run down Mrs. Jones as you've been running her down. You've got to give it up, regardless of how much fun it is to lay it on or to tell your neighbors about it. You've got to stop. Now, it's the stopping the feeding of the negative emotions. Uh, we've talked about in some detail the fact that the suggestion that I suggested for you at the hypnagogic state for yourself can do remarkable things in helping you slow down on a tempo. Can help you begin to give up some of these negative things if you phrase it in a positive suggestion and keep working with yourself. As you go to sleep and as you wake up, it will work for you. I have seen a person in a somnambulistic state being suggested to that when they are burned with a match, that they will raise a blister that will not hurt them, and then that the blister will go away. And I have, in the same right after that, struck the match and touch them with the end of a pencil and watch it get red and watch the blister rise and watch it go away all within a few minutes. The mind can do anything to this physical body of yours if you direct it. And it's doing it now. And it's the negative things that we are doing about our bodies. And the choices that we are making. If you want to give up sweets, or partly give them up, begin to suggest to yourself, you can do it. And you, the suggestion will help you and strengthen you in doing it. That's systematic thought control.
The sheet that I just gave you and talked to you about there for a few minutes can give you a picture of where you are being more negative. Just look at the scores, the top and the bottom. And uh, I know some of you will try very desperately to come out even. You know, I'm, I'm not really bad and I'm not really good, sort of in the middle. But your friends and your family may not. That's why you should use it. I gave you a copy that you could get duplicated so you could... I can't give you enough of them. I don't know how much family you got. <laughs> now, this whole business of inspirational reading is a way of beginning to feed the mind something to take the place of the junk that we read. I discovered myself, I used to read, I'd read somewhere that all the presidents, great presidents, and very smart people love to read mystery stories. So I began to read mystery stories, like I was eating peanuts. I would just read any number. I knew all about the best mystery writers. And one day I, I backed up and took a look, and I discovered that what was happening to me, I was getting more and more hold of more and more, looking for more and more that got more killings and more murders. Not just one. It was really bad. I wanted several. It, I, I, one, one wasn't enough. Well, I was looking for more and more and more. So I stopped. I just gave up. You know, this wasn't particularly difficult. But uh, giving up scotch was <clears throat> a little more difficult. <laughs> I like to drink. And um, I did this in college. I did it during the war. Too much. And uh, I like to drink. And this was a real thing. And this I had to use suggestion on. Day and night. This I had to really get scared. <laughs> and uh, so my body helped me. And uh, really fixed it so I, I would do it or else. <laughs> and I've done it or else. So I've stopped. But there are some that will be hard and some that will be easier. But the inspirational reading is a great help. Now, not just the Bible, though the Bible is wonderful. Dad said we ought to learn, memorize the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th of John. It, it's, it's tremendous stuff. And you can read it and understand that it's speaking to you, not general, but to you. He mentioned many psalms. You may love some of them. But I found in the Persian poets, I found in the Bhagavad Gita, which I love, and I reread and read again, you, uh, uh, the secret of the golden cloud. These are beautiful, inspirational things from other dimensions, other people. Find them for yourself and substitute them for the murders and the rapes and the newspaper that you repeat the stories of. And isn't it terrible that so-and-so is happening again? And we repeat it over and over and over, and it builds and builds. Uh, substitute the stuff that you're watching on television with, with the, this person jumping from this bed to the other one. Substitute it for the, the, uh, the horror or the, the, the uh, trash that all of us pick up now and then and get involved in. And as you begin to, the mind will respond. That inspirational reading can be tremendously helpful. Um, this business of uh, developing a sense of humor is very important. Dad talks about this in terms of, of really working at to begin to be able to laugh at yourself is, is wonderful. You, you will make real progress when you can not take yourself so seriously and begin to be able to smile at yourself and chuckle at yourself and laugh at yourself. Nothing is more ridiculous than man in his sex businesses. <laughs> and we can, that's certainly we can laugh at at times. We may have to do it all by ourselves, but uh, <laughs> it, it is funny. And you know it, and I know it. Now, the whole business of, uh, of these things that we can be humorous about with ourselves 
and then begin to see the ridiculous. Don't laugh at people, but with people. The, the ridiculousness of uh, situations and conditions, and we can begin to ease tension all over the place with that business of a sense of humor. Finally, I should emphasize the dream material. For, as I've said, it provides not only insight into where we really are, but it provides also the tremendous opportunities for discovery of new dimensions, of psychic capacities that we did not know we had, of creativity that can be provided some of the great dreams of man have produced some of the great literature, some of the great music, some of the great paintings, but can produce for us simple, creative ideas that begin to change and help us. And that can be in the dream healing experiences. The dream itself is frequently an healing experience that you can become aware of if you will record and begin to work with the language of your unconscious. You've been a wonderful group this week, and I want to thank you for your attention. And for the love that I've felt from so many of you, the caring, and that I've been able to try to express in a little measure for you. We've been happy that you're here. And we hope that you will come back again and again. Thank you. Love alcohol as two ounces of witch hazel, two ounces of Russian white oil, one ounce of tincture of Ben Zorin, one four ounce of all of sassafras, one quarter ounce of pure olive oil. Shake these together each time before. Small to be massaged into this portion of the body as indicated. From the sixth then daughter to the first and second cervical and in that direction, not from the cervical area or the daughter, but from the sixth and seventh daughter toward the cervical. Just what the body will absorb. See? We would also after such at such manipulation, then massage and make after the fourth or fifth treatment of this compound, use those of corrective measures in the alignment along the cerebral spinal system, not moving all at once in the area indicates where these are necessary for alignment 